What is the legal status of bulk data collection right now as we understand it? And I guess how, how sustainable is our current regime of this, you have no privacy interest in information you give to a third party in light of what has happened with the NSA over the past few months. So the claim that you have no interest in third-party data that's been uh, given to, for instance, a telephone service provider, that comes from a case called Smith v. Maryland, uh, which is a case from 1979 when there was an individual who had been robbed who gave a description of the robber to the police, as well as a 1975 Monte Carlo car that she had seen uh, at the scene of the crime. Uh, she subsequently was called on her home telephone by an individual who said he was a robber, uh, who then told her to go out onto her front porch where he drove slowly by the house in a Monte Carlo. The police then saw this car in the neighborhood, found out the license plate, and used it to figure out who owned the car, and then asked the telephone company to place a pen register on his telephone. Now, this case, Smith vs. Maryland, uh, within 24 hours, they actually recorded him calling Patricia McDonough, who was the victim of the crime. They used that to get a warrant to go to his house and found the phone book marked uh, to her name in his house itself. So in this case, the court said, well, look, that individual did not have a uh, privacy interest in the information which the telephone company had been collecting about any numbers he dialed. So the proponents of the NSA program look to this case and say third-party data is not constitutionally protected. It is not a search within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. The problem with this particular uh, case and with referring to it and using it as a way to justify the program, well, there are a number of problems, but the first problem is that the facts of Smith vs. Maryland are very unique. Uh, in that instance, the police had reasonable suspicion to assume that an individual was engaged in abusive, threatening, and illegal behavior. Uh, the government would like to treat every American as though they were Michael Lee Smith in Smith vs. Maryland. Uh, and the problem is that technology is no longer just a simple recording of a number somebody dials in a 24-hour period. What the government is now doing with the bulk metadata collection program is they are collecting all telephone calls made. Uh, the trunk identifier information will tell where people are located because you have a cell phone and where you call from on your cell phone is picked up and that can be transmitted as well through this bulk collection program. It can identify content. So if you call a suicide hotline or if you call a political party headquarters or if you call a rape crisis line, all of this information will be picked up. And then, of course, social network analysis can be done on it. So it can reveal your relationships, your dependencies, uh, your thoughts with whom you associate, all sorts of additional information can be gleaned. So because of technology, we're in a completely different circumstance than we were in 1979 when the third party doctrine, when the concept of that was really born in Smith First Maryland. It, it seems to be a problem of piles. That is, you know, if I if we're using this in this one instance, uh, as I think one of the Paul Rosenzweig suggested that uh, David Centel in a recent case said, zero plus zero plus zero equals zero. That is, if we could use uh, any given data point in any given time, just the addition of those doesn't create a problem, but it it does create a problem. Yeah. So the, uh, actually, Judge Egan also referred to this. She's a foreign intelligence surveillance court judge. And in her August 2013 opinion that was recently released, she also says, look, you can't have a Fourth Amendment right to search uh, spring into existence ex nihilo, right? You can't suddenly have something come from nothing. Uh, the problem is this isn't zero plus zero plus zero. This is zero plus 10 plus 20 plus 30 plus infinite uh, amount of information that one can actually potentially glean from all of this uh, data analysis. So the technologies that are in place are fundamentally different than what was in place in 1979, the time when uh, phones were actually billed by the minute. You didn't even know the phone numbers you called, right, at that time. And now the kind of intrusive technologies uh, that can be used to find out very private information. So if one asks, you know, do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in this information, many people don't even realize what they're telling the telephone company through this bulk message data or what it tells about them. So how can you reasonably say that you have no expectation of privacy if you don't even realize what you're telling either the telephone companies or more than that, the government, as it aggregates this information? Oh, one of the things that, I, that I've always thought was important, and I'm sure uh, legal scholars also think it's important, is the idea that you have to be able to assert a right uh, in court should it be violated? And with this 
bulk data collection and, and other coll collections of other data, uh, there's no way to do that uh, because it's secret. So it, this it, is, yeah, this has been a big problem with surveillance cases to establish standing, to show, for instance, that you actually have standing in a case, you have to show that you've suffered a harm. And so in the Clapper case, which was decided last year by the Supreme Court, the court said uh, that they couldn't actually demonstrate that they had been placed under surveillance. Uh, what's happened now is in ACLU versus Clapper, which has come back to the Southern District of New York, uh, the ACLU again filed in the case and said, well, look, now that we have these documents, we can show that we have been part of the telephone metadata collection program because it affects everybody who are Verizon or AT&T or Sprint customers, and we are. Therefore, we can show we have standing. And the government's response to that has been, well, it's not enough to show that you have standing in terms of your information being collected. You have to show that we actually queried that data and access that information, and you don't have standing to show that because that information is now secret. Um, and so that's been kind of the, the legal response to the claim now that the party in the case, that the parties in the case have standing. So the Supreme Court is likely going to get cases uh, on this in the next year or two years. What, what, is, what are they likely to look at? What are the questions that uh, ought to be put before them and what questions probably will be put before them? So there's growing tension in Fourth Amendment jurisprudence between the Justice Scalia side of the court that looks at new and emerging technologies in terms of trespass, which is a more traditional uh, way of considering invasions of privacy, uh, and part of the court that looks at it as an application of the CATS test, which is a reasonable expectation of privacy, as Justice Harlan famously said in that opinion, both what individuals objectively expect uh, and what they re what they subjectively expect in terms of their expectations of privacy. What's interesting about the bulk data collection is under either test, it seems to run afoul of Fourth Amendment principles. So as a matter of trespass, this collection is precisely a general warrant, which at the founding uh, was really eschewed as being uh, repugnant to the idea of a free society. It was being used extensively by the British government. James Otis famously had an oration on this in which John Adams later said the child independence was born from this idea that you cannot issue a general warrant with nonspecific, no prior uh, information that would suggest that wrongdoing had been, is being, or is about to be committed. And so that's why we wrote the Fourth Amendment. Uh, our four, sorry, our three of the most important states would not ratify the Constitution until a provision dealing with general warrants was inserted. So Virginia, North Carolina, um, and New York, they said, look, we have to have something in there for the protection against general warrants warrants. And that's why we wrote the Fourth Amendment. Um, the idea was that if you have a general warrant, you can never say the government is trespassing on your property. That's the connection to trespass. And so what's happening here is this is a digital trespass that is happening. So it satisfies the trespass side of the jurisprudence that the court has. It also satisfies the reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, we recently had the Jones case that was handed down on GPS technology. And Justice Sotomayor and Justice Alito, uh, joined by Justices Kagan and others on the court, said that under a reasonable expectation of privacy test, applying CATS, uh, that you they were disturbed at the idea that you would have 28-day surveillance continuously using a GPS chip. Now, that case, again, was decided on trespass grounds, with Justice Scalia authoring the opinion. But Justice Sotomayor, for instance, very clearly said in her uh, opinion, in her concurring opinion, that she uh, would not extend uh, to third party data and exemption from Fourth Amendment concerns, that actually we had reached a point where these types of, the types of information you can glean about individuals represent a different kind of privacy interest than had historically attended third-party doctrine. And so what we're starting to see with that, with that case, with Jardines, which is the recent dog-sniffing case, again, decided on grounds of trespass, but Justice Kagan clearly says in her concurrence that it could just as easily have been decided on reasonable expectation of privacy grounds, that regardless of which approach one takes, there is growing support within the Supreme Court to find on grounds of Fourth Amendment uh, that this does represent a search within the meaning of the Fourth. Now, you mentioned uh, Justice Sotomayor questioning uh, the third party doctrine uh, and its, its legitimacy in this modern age where we share all sorts of information. Is there going to be a, a case where 
she seems to have been the only one to to have mentioned that or made made an issue of that. Uh, she she wasn't the only one because oh. Justice Alito's opinion also draws attention to what you could call the mosaic theory of privacy, which is when you start putting all the pieces together. And remember that the NSA telephony metadata collection program, the arguments could equally be applied to collection of financial records or bank records or email uh, envelope information or internet session times or internet uh, activity. So, um, so how long do we expect? Is there going to be something that's going to come before the court to to put some sort of constraints on this third party doctrine? Yeah, absolutely. There are a number of cases working their way forward. Henry Epic, for instance, is one of the cases. Uh, it's a, a application for a writ of mandamus that's been submitted to the Supreme Court uh, r- requesting that the court direct the NSA to immediately desist in their activities under Section 215. Uh, there's also the ACLU versus Clapper case, which has been resubmitted uh, in the Southern District of New York. Uh, that's another case to watch. Um, there are some very important FOIA cases actually related to this that uh, hopefully the EFF cases that we're starting to see that they'll uh, provide more information about what's happening, what's actually happening. Uh, there, there are various other cases. I think there are about a dozen cases that have been brought uh, as an in an effort to challenge uh, these programs that are currently underway. I think eventually they will make it to the court uh, because this is not just American citizens who are being placed within this uh, enormous data collection program. This is also the justices, uh, and this is also members of Congress. Uh, this is all branches of government. And so the implications in terms of separation of powers, in terms of long-term governance, and in terms of the aggrandizement of executive power, uh, it will take the other branches actually focusing on it uh, to try to get a hold of what's actually happening with new technologies. 